I'm Jennifer Kate with Hands Along the Nile, and we are so thankful to uh, RC's uh, New York chapter for co-sponsoring this with us tonight, and also for um, Roger and his team here at the Institute for, for having us. We really, really appreciate that. All of us are here tonight because of our interest in and our love for ancient Egypt. Hands Along the Nile um, will give you an opportunity to also become engaged with the modern people of Egypt and the future of Egypt, the youth. We are a, a nonprofit uh, based here in the US that supports development work uh, in the poorest communities in Egypt. We focus on women, on youth, on the poorest of the poor. Um, we have a lot of work with garbage collector community and also on people with disabilities. Um, as you know, Egypt has an illustrious, wonderful history and, and we're very hopeful about its future but it continues to struggle with issues of poverty and currently at least 40% of the population are living on less than $2 a day. So what are we doing? There are all sorts of projects I could tell you about. I'd like to tell you about um, one initiative that we're particularly excited about. I just heard a story this week about a woman, um, I'll call her Yasmin because her name sounds a little too close to, uh, to ISIS, so <laughs> I'm gonna rename her Yasmin. Yasmin um, is a middle-aged woman in the village of, uh, in one of the villages in the province of Minya in Upper Egypt. She's never been employed before in her life. She doesn't even have a, a high school education. She has four children and, and they have always struggled to get by. When it came time to get her daughters married, uh, Yasmin realized that she was really gonna have trouble paying for the weddings on her husband's meager salary as a, as a vegetable salesman. So Yasmin heard about a microloan program that we had in her village where we were teaching people um, how to start a small business. She went through the training, she learned all about writing a business plan, she was approved, and she got a very small loan to open a little grocery store. She has since repaid the loan and taken out a larger one. We're not talking big loans, we're talking $120 to start and then a bigger one to get more and more supplies. And her oldest daughter works with her at the grocery store. It's a flourishing little, when I say grocery store, I mean a little tiny kiosk that sells tomato paste and pasta and Coca-Cola and just the simple things you need. Um, <laughs> um, so, and Yasmin now is a full owner of the grocery store. It's a thriving business. She is an empowered member of her family, able to support her family, um, and, and she has been able to get her daughters married off. Um, and this is just one example of the many types of projects that we've been involved with um, in Egypt. I'll be in the back after if you'd like to hear more about HANDS or get signed up for our mailing list. Um, in the meantime, I would like to turn the program over to a longtime friend of HANDS Along the Nile, Dr. Sama Eskander. He is the President Emeritus of RC and also a program affiliate here at the Institute. It's the, indeed my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bagnell, who is, and of course we know he's an internationally uh, known uh, leader in the field of uh, ancient history and papyrology. He's known for his, uh, the quality of his scholarship and extraordinary uh, productivity, as we'll see. Uh, I recall we met about 15, 20 years ago, and we were reminiscing about this. Uh, I, I just found out through our conversation that uh, he started his career quite early, when he was seven years old, <laughs> when he was fascinated by ancient history, uh, and took this fascination from his grandfather, who was a physician, and um, never considered any other career. And uh, it's now 50 years later. So it's a quite a long, uh, uh, distinguished career. Uh, Dr. Bagnell uh, received his BA in, from Yale University and PhD from the University of uh, Toronto in Classics. He specializes in the social and economic history of Hellen Hellenistic, Roman, and uh, late antique Egypt. Uh, he joined Columbia University in 1974, where he taught for 33 years and was J. Professor of Greek and Latin and also Professor of History. During this time, 
He uh, served as Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences and Chair of the Department of Classics. Of Classics. He later joined NYU faculty in 2007 and as a, the first director of uh, ISAO, which I'm, I have the privilege of being affiliated with. He held many leadership positions in the fields of classics, papyrology, and co-founder of the multi-university consortium creating the advanced papyrological information system. Uh, among his best known uh, publications are Latin, uh, Egypt in late antiquity, the demography of uh, Roman Egypt, reading papyri, writing ancient history, early Christian books in Egypt. I'm not gonna go uh, over the uh, rest of the list because he has 50 books that were published. So I don't think we have the time for this. Uh, he also, uh, the author, of, he contributed to 225 uh, books and journals and 77 reviews. So it's a, it's a huge amount of uh, scholarship. He now directs NYU excavation projects at Amhira, uh, which is sponsored with Colombia in the Dakhla Oasis in Egypt. Uh, other current projects include editing of the graffiti from the Basilica of the Agora of ancient Smyrna, which he had just turned it in that yesterday. Congratulations, I know how it feels. Uh, he also had uh, pub working publications of the text from the excavations of Amhida and Perenaika, which he will be ready in about uh, one month. So please join me in uh, uh, welcoming Dr. Bagnell. Thank you, Same. Uh, I might mention that uh, Same and uh, his colleague Ogden Goulet, also here at ISAW, just had a volume of theirs on Abitus appear uh, a few days ago. So that's, uh, there's productivity elsewhere too. As the title of my talk promises, I'm going to concentrate uh, this evening on the uh, recent developments in our excavations at Amheda. <clears throat> but I need to put them in a bit of context, both for those who are completely new to it and perhaps for those who did not commit to memory everything I said last time <laughs> I spoke on the subject. Um, so I'll start out with a quick tour of earlier phases of our work, talk then about some of the new developments in areas we worked in, in the past, and finally turn to the newest areas that have just been opened up uh, in the last few years. Amheda is the largest surviving ancient site in the Dakla Oasis in Egypt's western desert. Um, the, in antiquity, it was second to Mothus, modern Mut, um, but Mut now is covered by the modern town to a large degree, so most of that is, at least for the present, irretrievably lost. Dakla was part of what the Greeks and Romans called the Great Oasis, which also included Karga. It's, uh, there's about 150 kilometers between Dakla and Karga, and between Dakla and the Nile Valley, several hundred. Uh, so it's a long way out. The Great Oasis is essentially a band of depression <coughs> in the western desert plateau, uh, which brings the surface uh, several hundred meters closer to the underground water, and thus makes it possible for water to reach the surface uh, through ancient springs, and uh, even now from wells. Back 7,000 years ago or so, much of this area was savanna with lakes, but it then dried out about 5,000 years ago and has been more or less the current climate since then. But in antiquity, even after this drying out, water still reached the surface pretty easily. Uh, either through natural springs or by digging fairly shallow 
wells shallow, at least by contemporary standards, when the wells can go down a thousand meters or so. Settlement in Dakla goes back uh, to Neolithic times, and we do have some traces of that period at Amheda in the form of lithics that have been found in the immediate surroundings. But for us, the story essentially begins in pharaonic times, and its uh, early phases are so far anything except clear. Um, here is a plan of the site. Most of what you see on this plan is not what we've excavated. It's what's visible on the surface. And uh, so it's been able to be mapped anywhere there wasn't a sand dune on top of it. I'll come back a little later to say something about our efforts to learn a bit about uh, Amheda before the New Kingdom. Uh, but for now, I'm going to plunge in where we began with our excavations, which is in the Roman period. When you walk across the surface of the site today, you see shallow remains of walls barely peeking above the surface and occasionally something taller. This is a Roman cityscape, and it is an inch or so beneath your feet uh, at most. But uh, there's usually two or three meters of sand there filling the ancient structures. Surface, as you can see, is covered with sand and uh, with millions, perhaps billions, of potsherds. We began in 2004, our first excavation season, to uncover a house that we already knew about uh, from a preliminary foray into it in 1979 by the Dakla Oasis Project. Uh, what they found then, just pulling sand away from the walls down to the depth of, uh, oh, I don't know, a meter and a half or so, was published. Uh, this is a plan of the house. Uh, the lower part of this kind of square that's the house proper, and then the upper part on the plan annexes that um, got added on later. There is a view of it from the north. Well, we found when we excavated it that there was a lot more to that painted room than had been seen in 1979. But on the other hand, the paintings that had been spotted in 1979 in the survey had deteriorated during the intervening 25 years, partly because the site guards were only too willing to pull back the sand for any generous open-palmed visitor. The house was about a 15 meter square, the residential core, uh, with an kind of a room in the center that was sort of a traffic switching point, uh, and then these annexes on the north side uh, that I mentioned. It was built <clears throat> around 335 to 340 and abandoned somewhere in the mid to late 360s. So it's got a lifespan of only about 25 to 30 years, <clears throat> which means that everything in it is very well dated uh, by most archaeological standards. Now, the undoubted center of attention in the house uh, is this central painted room that was partly opened up in 1979. Uh, it had scenes on the upper part of the wall, figural scenes, and below the kind of uh, stone imitation pattern that occupies the lower part. It turned out that some of the scenes were still in place on the wall and others had fallen off, some of them in big chunks, some of them in small chunks, some of them in millions of fragments of uh, very, very tiny amounts of paint. Among the scenes that were present on these walls now or originally were uh, Ares and Aphrodite caught in the act of adultery. Um, here you see the gods looking on on the scene uh, Helios, the sun at the right-hand side, the snitch uh, in the case, um, looking on, and the aggrieved husband off there to the left. Um, and here you can see Aphrodite surrounded there under the covering, and Ares' name here. Ares, of course, is disappearing off to the right in a usual male talent for absence at the critical moment. 
Elsewhere there is the scene that was above the north wall that you saw the stonework of earlier, uh, now badly damaged but showing Odysseus returning to Ithaca after 20 years away and being recognized by his servant Eurycleia. There's also a scene of Perseus and Andromeda. There's a scene, you just see a fragment of it here that comes from Orpheus charming the animals with his music um, and quite a lot more. Uh, you'll see a bit more of this later. The um, artistic quality of these paintings is on the whole pretty good. It's not quite, shall we say, up to metropolitan standards, the kind of thing that you might find in a millionaire's mansion in Alexandria, uh, but not bad. Unfortunately, the same was not true of the technical quality. Uh, it was done on a very thin wash of white plaster over mud plaster, and this has not even in antiquity stood up very well. Uh, it was renovated once already during that short period that the house was occupied. So there were these layers of touching up and repainting, um, restoring the room. But you know, this is what life is like living in a mud brick house. Uh, so one shouldn't be terribly surprised. And after all, the plaster has many enemies. Its cohesion isn't very good. It doesn't stick to the underlying mud plaster very well. And of course, there are lots of insects around very happy to eat the straw that was in the mud plaster. Um, termites, for example. So there are lots of problems to deal with. Along the west side of the house, rooms were painted in somewhat less um, distinctive, but still rather colorful patterns, uh, the green room, which you see a bit of here, and the red room, very similar pattern, but a different color. And as you will see toward the end of this talk, uh, this house was not unique at Amheda in having paintings like this. We also found, um, I have to confess, dearer to my heart than painting, uh, in the house, uh, quite a few ostraca, potsherds with writing on them, uh, which seemed to center on an individual named Serenus. And a letter that was found in the first season uh, from him to somebody else shows him asking for a copy of a decree that he had written. That could mean only that he was a member of the city council because those are the people who wrote decrees. And this seems in keeping with the rather upper class character of the house, including the rather lavish amount of Greek culture at stake. More traces of this man kept turning up in subsequent seasons and his personality began to take shape. I could in fact devote the entire lecture to Serenus um, and indeed I have done a lecture on his subject but that's not what we're going to do this evening. We found that on the north there was for some part of its existence uh, a school where Greek literature and rhetoric were taught, uh, published uh, some years ago in the Journal of Roman Archaeology by uh, Paola Davoli, David Ratson, and Raffaele Cribiore. Uh, it had a wall with verses in Greek, um, heavily marked up with signs that would allow pupils uh, to learn to write their own verse by imitation. Um, and this is the first schoolroom of this kind that was ever discovered in Greco-Roman Egypt. So uh, it's truly an extraordinary find. The uh, school probably dates from around the time of the building of Serenus's house because they share a party wall. So 335 to 340, somewhere in there. By mid-century probably, the school was gone and the building had been transformed into storage and into stables for Serenus's donkeys. Well, all of this was pretty clear five years ago, although we've filled in some blanks in the intervening years. But at that point, we had only begun to catch a few glimpses of what was to become the next obsession in studying Roman Trimithus, the name that it had in this period, which is the baths. We did find early on uh, a dry 
bath, the so-called laconicum, which is essentially a dry sauna, was found under one of the courtyards north of Serenus's house that had been used for dumping trash. Um, there's what it looked like after clearance when you can see uh, the pillars there, the hypocaust structures that supported it allowed the hot air to come underneath the floor and make it into a nice warm room, which is of course something you don't need most of the year in the oasis, but in winter it must have been nice. The schoolroom turned out to have been built over what had been a latrine when the uh, baths were in use. Uh, under another part of this northern structure, which you see here, uh, we found signs of bathing structures, little pools, um, and indeed in one point where we went deep below the floor, part of a column that belongs to an earlier phase showing that the bath was not a single period structure but went on for quite some time and was in fact completely rebuilt. We have to say that anybody who is fond of decline and fall narratives for the Roman Empire can take comfort in the fact that the earlier version of the bath was clearly much nicer than the later version. Uh, so bathing was going downhill. As we moved north, um, we found much more, including a large columned hall, which you see here, surrounded by various smaller rooms, and also circular rooms with very heavy hydraulic plaster, which were supplied with water and used for bathing activities. Another latrine also came into view. Um, since we don't find any signs of uh, what we would describe as sanitary facilities in the houses, um, we're glad at least to find latrines in public buildings. So today we can say with some confidence that there once stood a very large Roman bath, perhaps in the third century, maybe even earlier. We don't have very good dating for this yet. Uh, you can see here an outline of what the Roman baths might have looked like. We haven't found all of them yet. Uh, there's more under the street adjoining and probably other houses as well. But it was a big place, a very impressive structure. At some point it went out of use and some of it seems to have been used as a dump. Uh, some of it was kind of leveled and then built over by the school and Serenus's house. But part of it survived and was then rebuilt uh, in the fourth century, perhaps only after 350 actually, and turned into a smaller bathing establishment, uh, more typical of contemporary habits in the early Byzantine world. And you see its plan here. That's, of course, what we actually see in its current form. But in fact, that work was never finished. Replastering was still going on at the time of its abandonment. And we found in one room a large pile of sandstone tesserae in several colors, intended for a mosaic floor that was never laid. We don't know why. But the stones were abandoned along with a big pile of what would have been the mortar between the stones. Now this is too bad because there is not a single mosaic floor in the entire western desert and in fact almost none in all of upper Egypt. So we would really have liked to have had the only one. We had the, have the only one you know in the planning phase so to speak uh, but never actually executed. The roof over the large pillared hall, that's the upper part of it on the plan here, eventually burned and collapsed. But that may have been after abandonment. This proto-Byzantine bath was thus never brought into actual use. Anyway, this is still an area of discovery for us. There are a number of adjoining areas that we want to excavate to see what some of the other parts of the bath were. Uh, and get a better sense of it because it's really quite an extraordinary structure and not really paralleled by anything else that's been excavated so far in the oasis as a whole. If all goes well, we will return to the building this coming season. <laughs>
Now, Amhada was not, in fact, only a city of the 4th century AD. And starting in 2005, we began work, which some of you may remember, on the hill where we supposed the temple of the god Thoth had stood. A temple already known to us uh, to a small degree from the fact that some of its blocks were reused uh, in houses in the nearby town of El-Kasra, which itself was built to a considerable degree inside and on top of the ruins of a Roman fort that probably dates to the Diocletianic period, the late third century. That fort has been studied quite actively in recent years by another mission, <laughs> but what we have discovered um, is that the Temple of Thoth had been built and decorated in its latest form uh, under Titus and Domitian, perhaps a little bit under later emperors, but their cartouches don't survive, so we don't know. But here are a couple of blocks from the reign of Titus and uh, then from Domitian. The recent year's work, since we had gotten to that, has shown uh, that this temple incorporated a large number of blocks from earlier temples on the site. And so now we've had a very rich harvest of these decorated blocks, a huge number of them, in fact, in 2014. And this has shown just how extensive these earlier shrines were, particularly those built under Amasis, the great king of the Sayite dynasty, and Darius I, uh, in the period when the Persians ruled Egypt. Of course, what we also discovered was that not a single one of these serial temples still stood. All had been torn apart and had collapsed into vast pits dug on the Temple Hill by local farmers looking for fertile soil to put on their expanding fields. That's what these pits look like. And you can get a sense of just how horribly complicated the hill is. And I see Roberta Casagrande Kim um, trying to smile in the memory. Um, the black outlines here are the pits, and the red are the stone blocks that were found, filling them and spilling all over the place. An enormous mess. Our lead Egyptologist, Olaf Kapper, has been for several years assembling the blocks of these dismantled temples inside a wonderful structure built uh, with the financial support uh, of Arce's Antiquities Endowment Fund uh, and designed by our architect, Nicholas Warner. So many were found in 2014 that this building is no longer large enough to hold everything and display what we have to show the world. Uh, so we would like to expand it now. But someday we hope it will be complete uh, after we find the funds. And it will then hold displays of the blocks from the different temples, allowing the visitor to see the evolution of the Temple Hill over time, even if none of it is actually standing where any of these temples originally stood. And that's a sacred landscape that we can trace quite well over a period of about 700 years. Here and there in mid the rubble have turned up signs of a yet earlier sanctuary of Thoth, uh, including a stele of Seti II and a Ramesside school text on an ostracon. Uh, and traces of kings of the third intermediate period, like this hieratic stele of the 23rd dynasty. And perhaps most exciting of all, evidence for building activity under Petabastus IV, whom probably most of you could not give me a century for uh, if you were forced to. Well, Petabastus IV, who was only recently renumbered from third to fourth, uh, was a rebel Egyptian king uh, under the reign of the Persian king Cambyses. <clears throat> Petabastus IV is in fact hardly known from any other uh, evidence in Egypt. Um, Copper has argued that Petabastus may in fact have had his main home base in the oases and that a war against him by Cambyses may be the historical kernel behind the stories that we find in Herodotus and elsewhere 
concerning the disappearance of Cambyses' army in the desert. Um, no, they didn't, as it turns out, disappear in a sandstorm. You can stop looking for them. Um, but a sandstorm sounded like a much better story to the Persians than admitting that they had been beaten by a no-count minor Egyptian rebel. So we can only hope that more traces of this short-lived uh, and unfortunate king will turn up in years to come. The 2015 season brought a substantial harvest of blocks with no decoration at all. But it was still a matter of some interest because the shape and module of the blocks is nothing like those from the later temples. And a large column base that turned up uh, is in the view of Paola Davoli, the archaeological director in command of all the field operations, likely to belong to the New Kingdom. So something that may help us begin to see a little bit of how the Temple of Thoth goes back already that far. So in effect, we're adding another half millennium or so to the history. It seems likely, actually, that there was a structure at the west end of the temple, perhaps a contra temple, uh, in the Roman period, and that it was built out of the blocks from a New Kingdom temple. Recent years have started to give us an idea even of pre-New Kingdom Dakla. Now, we have long known that it existed, in part because magnetometry, some years back, that this has a vague outline of a rectangular structure running from lower right to upper left, uh, which is about 50 by 100 meters. So this is a pretty good sized structure. Um, still buried. We don't know exactly how deep, but the magnetometer experts thought five to ten meters down, so not exactly a quick and easy uh, excavation to undertake. Uh, so it's still buried, um, but there were also in it some anomalies that suggested ovens. Well, it turns out we do have ovens, and we have an uncountable number of bread molds that must have been baked in those ovens, and indeed there you can see an oven. We actually excavated an oven this year. Now, ovens are not generally regarded as very sexy things to excavate, and most archaeologists steer clear of them. Um, but, of course, Amheda being the project it is, uh, we have a director of archaeological operations who likes ovens and was really hot to excavate. Our archaeobotanist found traces of grapes in it, and we're a bit puzzled by this. We don't quite know what they were doing there, if uh, it was just grape stems being used as fuel or what. It is clear that at least by the second intermediate period, and quite likely earlier, we think perhaps as early as the Old Kingdom, there was an extensive bread production facility on the site, probably within that ghostly enclosure that was in the previous slide. And maybe we will get a little bit of that someday. Later on, there seems to have been a sacred animal necropolis on the east side of the hill. Um, we've known this for a while, but uh, it was only this year that Salima Ikram and Megan Spitzer were able to come and open up most of the clay coffins, of which you see one in the corner uh, in this slide, and extract the bird bones inside them. They found that one of them had whole skeletons, including an eagle and ibises. Now, ibises we expected because the ibis is the bird that represents Thoth. Uh, but the eagle was something of a surprise. Others had more miscellaneous rag bags of bird bones, including chickens, which were not sacred to anybody that I know of, um, but also raptors. On the gruesome side, Megan reported that some of the bones in the miscellanies had been gnawed by rodents, which suggests that they'd been lying on the ground for a while uh, before they were scooped up and dumped into the coffins. That doesn't give you a good feeling for um, what some of the 
faithful who were paying for these things might have been getting for their money. We don't yet have a good date for this cemetery, which also produced some very nice figurines of Osiris and some miniature uh, pottery offering bowls. The estimates have ranged from late period to late Ptolemaic. Uh, I'd like to come back to this area at some point and see if we can get better stratigraphy here. But at any rate, Pharaonic Amhada is coming into somewhat better focus. And we began this year also a systematic study of the pottery found on the hill. Now, this ceramic material has no good stratigraphic context, um, but nonetheless, taken all together and sorted out, it begins to give us some sense of the chronological range uh, of the settlement. All of this represents further development of initiatives that were underway before the last time I spoke to RC New York, and indeed before the revolution of 2011, which shortened our season that year to one week before we were dramatically evacuated. <clears throat> we have since had four seasons, each fraught with uncertainty until a late stage because of the constantly changing security situation <clears throat> and the equally unstable regulatory and bureaucratic climate. The xenophobic Minister of Antiquities under Morsi, for example, announced that we could not bring undergraduates for a field school. There went our tuition-driven funding model <clears throat> and a great deal else. But we have managed to work nonetheless in all four of these years, and the last two have been notably successful despite all of our advanced worries. One major new area was a structure a little to the east of the baths, uh, which is indicated by the arrow on that plan, uh, situated on a low rise, which when we looked at the plan even before excavation, rather strongly suggested that it might be a church. After the excavation uh, by the Dakla Oasis Project of three churches at Kellis um, and the long-known church at Darabu Meta, uh, and Nicola Aravecchia's excavation of a church at Ain el Gedida, it was hardly a surprise that we did in fact find a church. This was excavated in 2012 and 13 by Nicola with a small team. Various circumstances have conspired to make it impossible to continue in this area the last two years, but the entirety of the building itself has been excavated apart from substructures under the rooms that uh, you see labeled as R12, R4, R3, and R2 here. Uh, we are able to say that the structure is indeed a church built in the fourth century, probably around or shortly after the middle of the century with very deep foundations uh, capable of supporting a heavy building. Here you see a general view of it. And here you can see the deep trench that we took down. The foundations go all the way to the bottom of that trench. Uh, so it must have supported a fairly heavy superstructure, not just a kind of one-story Quonset hut church or something like that. It's uh, main Part consists of a nave with side aisles and a western return aisle, fairly typical basilica pattern with its main entrance at the west end. Uh, it, at the east end was a platform reached by steps from the side, as you can see here, um, which had then uh, ac provided access to the usual set of rooms, the apse where the service would be led, and side pastophoria. The walls of the church were lined with benches. The only one surviving well is along the south side, which you can see here, but they were certainly along the other sides as well. As you can see here also, the walls of the church were covered with white plaster, but of course there might have been something more higher up because the walls don't really survive to any great height. What did survive was a considerable part of the ceiling made with palm ribs and with a coating of painted white plaster, which had all collapsed onto the floor, where, of course, as always, we found it in a million fragments. Some of them are still there, in fact. But enough was retrieved that we were able to reconstruct it. Here you see some more fragments. <clears throat> 
And here is the reconstructed drawing done by Dorothea Schultz. Squares, triangles, lozenges, pentagons, hexagons, octagons, uh, a real cornucopia of geometric shapes. There may have been a simple vegetable motif around the geometric design, which seems to us to have been intended to create the impression of a coffered wooden ceiling, which it wasn't. <coughs> On the south of the church proper was an extensive complex of rooms preserved in parts, as you can see here, severely eroded in other parts. The complex was accessed from the north, uh, both through a doorway in the southeast corner of the church and through a larger entrance um, that you can see uh, in the southern wall. And uh, as you can see, there were the doorway from the church there led to some steps, of which you can see the first few that went up to a lower landing and then would have gone up to the second floor. Well, we don't know what was on the upper floor, maybe just more rooms, but perhaps there was a gallery as well. We, it's a little hard to say for sure. Five burials were found in the church, both in the nave and in the aisles, and at least one of them in the southern complex. Four of these have so far been excavated, and I'll say something about their contents in a moment. Of the rooms that served as the pastoria and the sanctuary, almost nothing remains except the vaulted substructures and you can see part of one of the vaults here. This one has been excavated, um, and we found the mud brick sub superstructures of three more tombs in it. Uh, these await excavation in a future season when our physical anthropologists can be present to deal with the bodies that we assume are still there. In all likelihood, the two rooms next to them, to the south, also had burials in them, so we will have a bumper crop if we can once get them emptied. Now the burials excavated so far, you can see some of them here, are consistent in type. The bodies are all laid on their backs, oriented with the heads to the west, so as to face east upon rising, a typical feature of Christian cemeteries. There's another one. No evidence of coffins or of beers or anything else. But in some, there were remains of textiles, suggesting, of course, that the deceased were wrapped in shrouds, as we would expect. In addition, plant remains tentatively identified as uh, bundles of myrtle and rosemary were found on the human remains in the best preserved of these. Tomb one contained an adult male, about 45 to 50 years of age, whose skeleton showed significant pathologies, including healed fractures, fused bones, and evidence of sharp force trauma. The skeletal remains in tomb two belong to a juvenile female, roughly 16 years old, with no major pathologies. Tomb three was a burial of an adult female, 25 to 30 years of age, with very well-preserved hair. Um, and in tomb four, a 35 to 40-year-old male individual uh, who had intact hair that showed uh, signs of treatment with henna during his lifetime. And these have collectively led us to see this as a funerary church, uh, which housed persons of both sexes and not only high status adult males as one might have imagined. Uh, that is to say, in a regular city church, one would imagine that one would get clergy uh, and possibly uh, donors, um, and really nobody else would be entitled to that. But this is perhaps comparable to the West Church at Kellis, <clears throat> and also to the church in the cemetery of Bhagawat in the Karga Oasis. Now, of course, the implication of this view of the building, if we're right, is that Tremitha should have had at least one more church, uh, a normal urban basilica comparable to the large East Church at Kellis. <clears throat> we haven't identified this yet, so our eyes are open. This year we had undertook another project intended for last year originally, but postponed after the military didn't quite get around to processing security clearances for half of the team. This was a survey supported by a grant from the Antiquities Endowment Fund, 
of rooms in which painted plaster could be seen visibly peeking above the surface of the site. Now, there must be many more such rooms in which the plaster is completely invisible to us, but we felt that it was important to get a sense both of what kinds of painting were there and of what condition the paintings were in. We were acutely sensitive to this issue because the paintings in the House of Serenus were both very captivating on the one hand, but very fragile on the other. And we were worried that other paintings as well would be on thin layers of white plaster that were vulnerable. They fall off easily, and the termites love them, and so on. And the humidity level around the site has been rising in recent years as agriculture has crept closer and closer. We fear that these things don't have a long future ahead of them, a few decades perhaps, and even that could be too optimistic. We don't really know. So we ran a short intensive survey season with two archaeologists, two conservators, and one art historian uh, who was the project director for this operation, uh, Susanna McFadden, who has extensive experience of Roman and late antique painting uh, at other Egyptian sites, including perhaps most visibly the Chapel of the Tetrarchs at Luxor, which I imagine many of you have seen, another important RC supported project of which the publication is now in press. So we surveyed about 20 rooms, discovering more as we went, and we could have gone further, but we felt the sample was sufficient for our purposes. The results exceeded our expectations by far. The methodology employed was very simple. We dug small test trenches up against the walls of the rooms that the topographers had identified in earlier season as having decorated plaster. In order to maintain the integrity of the archaeological contexts, no more than one meter of windblown sand was removed from each trench, usually less. In fact, the um, plaster revealed was cleaned and consolidated by the conservators, and all of the related features, the walls, the deposition units, and so on, were properly documented according to our usual excavation protocols in the space of a single day and the trenches were then backfilled. The removal of just this small amount of sand was more than enough to assess the condition of the plaster and reveal its decorative motif. So you can see here, these are the areas in which we worked. Um, five buildings, 19 rooms, 33 trenches. Of these 33 trenches, only five revealed on decorated white plaster. The rest of the 28 had a rich corpus of decorated plaster, including a colorful variety of motifs. Molded stucco, for example, as you can see here. Figural only in one case, where there was this very nice head in the middle of a medallion, uh, but otherwise non-figural, some of which are quite similar to those known from the House of Serenus, uh, particularly in the green room and the red room. And uh, here you can see that you've got the same kind of pattern here below the upper border. Uh, others bear um, striking resemblance to some of the houses at Kellis, uh, nearby site in the oasis. Um, but others are so far unique to the oasis. This essentially seems to be kind of like an oriental carpet pattern with uh, these bands parallel to one another coming in. Um, you get an imitation stonework, uh, not the kind of polychrome marble that we get in the House of Serenus, but something looking more like ashlar masonry. And then the very bright colored bands here that look actually very similar to a fabric that we looked at the other day for a sofa covering. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, given these results, what are we going to do? Well, this we don't know. Um, it is a real conundrum. We would, of course, like to excavate them all and record them all very fully before the humidity gets to them. But what then? Would we just backfill them, as we have the House of Serenus, restoring them as possible to the status ante quo? Should we try to apply treatments and coverings that would make them able to be visited? 
And could that even be done without simply destroying them even faster than the humidity could? Well, our approach in the case of Serenus's house was, in fact, so far, to backfill it and put a covering on the central painted room. The sand provides a buffer for the humidity, absorbing moisture that otherwise would go directly into the plaster. The roof makes it too hard for the guards to show the room to tourists. Instead, we built a full-scale replica of the house, which is again Dr. Warner's work, and decorated it to match everything that survives in the original. The extraordinary reproduction of the ancient paintings was the work of Dorothea Schultz, working with several assistants over the course of the work. She projected photogrammetric images of the originals, which had been drawn up like this, onto the walls with a digital projector, traced the outlines from the projected images, and then painted them. And so this chariot scene that you see here is now on the wall up there. Other aspects reconstructed from small fragments had to be done somewhat more freely by laying out the probable framework and filling it in. This was done with the case of the dazzling dome of which only small fragments had survived to provide hints of the original pattern. You see um, the work going on there and there is an angle shot of it uh, showing some of the rest of the room. The scene that you saw earlier of the gods is now reconstructed on the wall in all of its glory. Um, and a banquet scene on the opposite wall, which we like to think represents the family that lived in the house, enjoying themselves at dinner with uh, entertainment and a large amphora of wine standing to the ready. This year, the work in that room was finished, uh, including some panels like that one. And then the fragments of Orpheus, of which you saw one earlier, were reproduced in a much fuller scene like that. And at one side, we finally decided that there had been a niche, although it was poorly preserved, it was hard to tell, and that has also been recreated. We hope to open this to the public uh, sometime soon, but that again depends on getting the funding for protective railings and explanatory panels and the other paraphernalia of a modest visitor center. Finally, we launched a new area this year uh, under Roberto's direction. A decade ago, a local boy brought us this very beautiful piece of thick plaster that he had found on the surface. It has a fragment of Greek poetry on it which Rafaela has been trying valiantly to do something with, and I think made some progress. Um, he also told us where it had come from, and so we promptly dubbed that structure the House of the Poet. Well, we began to excavate it this year, and so far we have not found more poetry there, to our disappointment, but it's nonetheless a house of great interest from several points of view, and there's a lot more of it to go, so we don't know what we will find. It's about triple the size of the House of Serenus, roughly 30 by 26 meters, but really very, very large, uh, with at least 12 rooms. And only a small fraction of it, you see here, got done this year. It has a rather grand entrance hall of about six and a half by eight meters, with three of the walls covered in lime plaster, mostly decorated in black and white panels, above which ran a narrow geometric band of yellow blue, red, and green interlocking squares. Nothing survives of the plaster above that, but judging from fragments found scattered in the sand, we believe that the plaster was most probably white and without any figurative motifs. Several modeled decorations in gypsum, mostly palmettes and volutes, were found during the excavation, probably part of a modeled stucco cornice, placed still higher on the walls beneath the flat ceiling. The room also opened into the southern half of the complex via two monumental pilasters, uh, also covered in black plaster, 
which had uh, niches on the north side with an image painted below, a man holding grain ears on the western pilaster. Because of the fragility of the remaining plaster, preliminary consolidation was carried out, uh, excavation was halted, and the room was partially backfilled. Other rooms also seemed to have very fragile plaster, and we deferred them to future seasons when we can have a larger team of conservators on hand. In the southern half of the house, room seven constituted the monumental fulcrum of the house, occupying a space of nine by 7.7 .7 meters. At the center are four columns, of which you can see remains one there, um, which supported a flat roof composed of wooden beams and covered in right, white plaster. Uh, due to the room's large size, the excavations this year were limited to removal of a very large collapse of mud bricks and the column shafts, which I don't think I need to point to <laughs> for you to see, um, in the western half. Uh, once cleared of the debris, looking very beautiful. The uh, western perimeter wall turned out to be articulated by five deep tall niches covered in white lime plaster. Uh, on this plaster uh, were drawn figural and Greek textual graffiti, most notably the image of a ship, which you see here, a Roman military ship, in fact, um, and a trident wheeling man. The last two weeks of excavation here focused on room one, the easternmost room of the uh, house, which, as you can see, also had a fair amount of collapse. In fact, several layers of wall and vault collapses were removed um, in order from top to bottom. First, the collapse of the second floor's western wall, which is what you see here. Um, then the collapse of the second floor's pavement. and then uh, deposit uh, there. So the pavement had a lot of fragmentary jars, various complete jars, some of them still sealed by mud stoppers with embedded Greek ostraca. Even something for me. Here you can see several of the uh, jars, um, these sort of submarine jars that are very typical of the oasis. And we now know exactly what they looked like with stoppers on top. The one at the lower left is perhaps the best preserved. And there is a close-up. And you can see the gigantic mud cone that's put on it with the ostracon stuck into the top. Um, there's a detail of it. Uh, these ostraca contain information about where the wine came from, what year it was from, and usually who produced it. Just the kinds of things you'd find on a wine label today. And we have a lot of these from Amheda, but most of them don't survive with the stoppers, let alone with the jars. So normally we don't have a complete view of them. There is the first floor vault collapse. <laughs> More beautiful stuff to be drawn carefully, um, recorded with magnetometry and removed. And then finally the west wall of the first floor and the first floor occupation layer. It kept going and it kept giving. We found a total of 81 Greek ostraca, all of them well tags, um, and a bronze ring, 19 intact ceramic vessels, 19 more fragmentary but reconstructable ones, and so on. And what will the future bring, you may wonder. Well. Of course, it's hard to say what will be possible. There are constant rumors that the military will not allow excavation work in the Western Desert until the threat from Libya is reduced. But if all goes well, we have some immediate business to finish. The East End substructures in the church and the adjoining courtyard. The area between the baths and the school and the adjoining street. Preparing the House of Serenus and the Temple Blocks building for opening to visitors. Continuing work in the house begun this season, Building 10, which is likely to go on for several seasons, given the amount of fragile plaster that we have to contend with. In the longer run, we clearly need to find the human and financial resources to tackle the large number of buildings with painted plaster before they vanish before the onslaught of moisture. That is a project for a decade or more. 
and I cannot yet see a clear path to how we're going to do it. More broadly, however, we have a diverse and very able team that will, over the coming years, be taking over the responsibility for directing the excavations that has been mine until now. This kind of generational transition, which will extend over the next few years, is a major challenge for any enterprise, and we are discussing what form it will take. The different individuals involved in the project have extremely diverse interests. And that probably means that instead of trying to have what's fashionable in modern archaeology, a clear, single-minded intellectual program, we will continue to bumble along into the future with a whole host of interests and uh, a whole set of people with somewhat competing, but we hope ultimately convergent and congruent and coexistent interests. The site is, after all, large enough to accommodate many intellectual directions, and there is no one right way to approach a site that encompasses several square kilometers, 3,000 years of occupation, and a diversity of remains that one might expect over the period from the Old Kingdom to early Christian Egypt. There's work for many generations to come, but some of it is urgent. If there's one thing we have learned from the last four years, it is that strong and stable governments are the best and by far the most important requirement for the safeguarding of ancient sites and monuments. And this morning's headlines about Palmyra can only have reinforced that lesson. We can only hope that Egypt will achieve this stability for the sake of its own people and also, of course, for the safety of its past. Thank you. text is previously unknown poetry, uh, mostly elegiac couplets. Uh, it is heavily didactic. It is urging the students to persevere and work hard in their labors um, and to uh, follow Heracles' example in working hard, uh, to, you know, emulate, you know, to, to cultivate the muses and blah, 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 right? <coughs> so, um, it's uh, sort of self-reinforcing uh, didactic examples. There is also on another wall um, some verses out of book four, is it, of the Odyssey, um, and also a very curious passage that seems to tell in different words an anecdote that is found in a work of Plutarch. Um, there's also a graffito in the house uh, verse from uh, a lost play of Euripides. So th there's a fair amount around. Yes? Uh, you said they found <clears throat> well, there is one circular structure that we believe is a well built out of baked brick uh, just a few meters from the house of Serenus. There are other abandoned ancient wells and spring mounds dotting the larger site. So it's clear that that there were a number of wells that were in very, very close proximity to the uh, urban occupation. So they didn't have to take the water very far. The yes, the baths would have required a lot of water. Uh, they would have required also a lot of fuel and a lot of money. And we don't know why they were abandoned. We would really like to know that. Yes. Well, Dakhla was beginning to take off as a tourist destination before the revolution, and outside moneyed interests had spotted it as the coming thing and built several tourist class hotels in the oasis, which now sit largely empty. Um, it doesn't help that there are still no flights to Dakhla. Uh, there's an airport, but there are no flights. But there are flights two days a week to Karga, which is two and a half hours away. Uh, but those flights run only if the company which runs them, Petroleum Air Services, feels like putting them on. And they cancel them uh, without notice from time to time. And you can't book them more than a week in advance. And you have to go to their office to book them also. <laughs> None of this makes tourism easy. Uh, now, the tourists who came to a large degree tended to come as part of desert 
tours where they would come through Bahareya, then Farafra. They'd come in four-wheel drive vehicles. And they would, all, all these people would go off road uh, in the white desert and camp out. And so you would get a combination of this sort of desert tourism with the cultural tourism. But because the off-roading has been prohibited by the military in recent times for security reasons, that whole traffic has dried up. And we're hoping that by the time we get done with the stuff we have to do, uh, people will start coming again and visiting what's there. We don't know. It, well, the site was abandoned, but the oasis was not. People continued to live there. Uh, it remained a Christian enclave quite right, late, um, converting to Islam only in the medieval period. Uh, but it is certainly the case that the extent of habitation diminished. And we don't know whether that was environmental or security driven or what. That's one of the great conundrums that we continue to wrestle with every year. Yes. The, there is much more rain falling now than there was when I first came to Dakla in the 1990s. And um, this worries us a whole lot, of course, from the point of view of the survival of mud brick sites. And also, I have to say, <laughs> of our own structures. You know, there was a horrendous storm uh, last year after our field season that collapsed one corner of the House of Serenus replica, which we rebuilt an enormous expense this year, and did grave damage to our excavation house, uh, part of which has also been put right at very considerable expense. Um, I can't afford too many more natural disasters like this. And in fact, we have not yet finished making good all of the damage to the dig house. Uh, there's probably another hmm, fifty or sixty thousand dollars worth of work to put that completely to rights, although it's habitable. Uh, so right now, uh, the climate has become somewhat different from what has been experienced uh, in the recent past. But as far as we can see, overall, the climate isn't greatly different from what it was like in the Roman period. Though even that certainly varied from time to time. Uh, we're beginning to get a lot more climate information about antiquity in recent years, and that suggests much more fluctuation and a much higher impact from those fluctuations than people used to think. Uh, there, is, there are a couple of Christian graffiti that we found up on the Temple Hill uh, that are probably fourth century, uh, and there are a fair number of Christian names in the ostraca, and one uh, ostracan that I think is an account probably belonging to a monastic establishment. So there are, there are traces of Christianity. We think there's another small church located south of the habitation area in one of the necropolis, but that's not been excavated yet. And I'm sure there's more to come. Okay, let me invite you to come across to the reception.